John chapter 13. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Appreciate you coming tonight. Appreciate you folks online being here with us tonight. And again, continue to pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for your goodness and mercy to us. And um, Lord, I know my life. I know how you've helped me. I know, Lord, the things that you've brought me through uh, to be at this place tonight. Father, I know a little bit about Michael's life. And all the things, Lord, that he's endured, all the things that he's gone through. Lord, for him to be doing what he's doing now and accomplishing, Lord, what you have accomplished over there. You've done that, Lord, through him, through us as a church. And Father, all of us, Lord, remember the hole that you dug us out of, the pit that the trap that the devil laid for us, we fell into it. And it's because, Father, we were in a place that we shouldn't have been to, be, to begin with. So, Father, we ask, dear God, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us out of that pit, allowing us to serve you. And, Father, our labor truly is never in vain. It is what your word promises us. It is why we continue to do your work. And some, Father, have remarked that they can't witness, they can't pass out tracts, they can't go door to door talking to people, but they can pray, they can study the scriptures. And Lord, in some cases, that's good enough. <clears throat> because, Father, we need people praying. We need people, Father, who know the Bible and have their trust in it. Because those are people the devil just cannot defeat. He cannot bring them down. He cannot cause them to fall. And if they do, Lord, you'll help them right back up. And we'll just keep standing for you like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We will not bow down. We will not fall to our enemies. We will do what the Apostle Paul said. In the time of our wrestling, in the time of our warfare, we will stand and having done all to withstand the enemy... And to stand, to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free so that we are never, ever again entangled in the yoke of bondage. So, Father, bless your people tonight. Bless your word. Our brethren and our fellowship of friends, Lord, they are with us around the world. But, Father, our adversaries are there as well. And our adversaries almost never appear at first to be adversaries. They start out appearing to be our friends. Help us, dear God, to be able to see the difference tonight. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Journey. I appreciate that. She got my part. All of God's people said, amen. Man, if you were just a young man, I tell you what, that's, that'd be the preacher in our family right there. All right, John chapter 13. Uh, if I remember right, uh, we're going to see a phrase in John chapter 13, uh, I probably have it marked in here somewhere. Um, well, I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but before I, in case I'm wrong, in case I'm ignorantly wrong. Um, but anyway, there's a phrase in here uh, that is very interesting to me, and we'll probably get into that uh, in a few months from now. But anyway, John chapter 13, verse 1. Uh, now, before the feast of the Passover, already, and we've got, we still got several chapters to go in the Gospel of John. How many is there? What, 21? Yeah, there is 21 chapters in the Gospel of John. Um, and that reminds me of a, um, a so-called Christian TV program. 
a Jewish believer, and I'm using these air quotes very loosely, by the name of Sid Roth, has a program called It's Supernatural. I'm trying to mimic the voiceover guy. And Sid Roth is about as far out in left field that you can get. And I don't mean liberal left field. I mean occult left field. He has on some of the wackiest uh, people who are so far away from the scriptures, about as far away as you can get without actually coming out and saying, yes, I worship Satan, why not? But anyway, he had a guy on his program. And a lot of the people that he has on his program, they, they have all kinds of dreams and visions and visitations from angels, visitations from Jesus. Um, does anybody know what automatic writing is? What is it, Cub? Yeah, a person will sit down like a, like a rock star writing lyrics to a song. Uh, like the song Stairway to Heaven. Stairway to Heaven was not written by a mortal man. It was written by a spirit. And um, including the music too. It was all inspired. But anyway, automatic writing is where a, a spirit, a familiar spirit comes over you. And you start writing out the words that they are channeling into your mind. And pretty soon you have a message from the stars. You have a message from the ascended masters and so on. Well, they had a guy on there um, that was telling Christians to do that. That if they wanted to hear from God on any particular day, get alone with God, go into a meditative trance, and all of a sudden you will start writing out things that supposedly God has told you, and that's your word for today. And I'm going, uh-uh, it's complete, the word's already done. If any man shall add unto the words of the book, I will add unto him the plagues that are written therein. If any man taketh away from the words of the prophecy of this book, I will take away his name out of the book of life. So he has people like that on there. Well, there was this one guy said that he had a vision where he was allowed to go up into heaven. And he saw Jesus there. Jesus was showing him around heaven. And they entered into a building that had books all over the place. And the man inquired, what are, what, what are all these books? And this Jesus told him, well, do you remember that verse that said, uh, it's, it's actually in the book of John, that there are many things that Christ did that were not written in this book, that if they were written in books, the world itself could not contain the books of the things that Jesus both said and done. So there was a library of books that Jesus, things that, that Jesus said and did that are up in heaven, hidden from man, and we're not allowed to see them. Now this man, after a while, was told that it's time to go back. And he said, but I would love to take some of these books with me. The Jesus that he saw up there said, okay, I'll let you take any three books that you see. I'll let you take them back down to the earth. So he grabs one, he grabs another one, and he grabs a third one. As he's walking out, Jesus grabs him like this and says, um... Give me that one back. And the guy said, but you said I could take any three books. He said, every one of them, but that one. You can't take that one. He said, why not? He said, the world is, they cannot hear this one yet. They're not ready. And he said, now what I'll do is, when the world is ready, I will bring you back up here. I will let you get this book. And I will let you bring it down to the earth because the world will be ready to hear what's in this book. So he said, okay. And he put the book back. 
The title of the book was John chapter 22. There is no John chapter 22. So what did Paul say? Though we or an angel from heaven bring you any other gospel than that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And what he was trying to, what he was trying to convey to every, and of course the, the studio audience was going, woo, woo, praise the Lord, woo. Those people are as dumb as the man that was trying to tell that story. To be that ignorant to believe that there is a 22nd chapter of John, but Jesus don't want us to have it yet because we can't handle it. But there will be a time when we're going to be brought up to the level to where we can handle John chapter 22. That is a lie. And the amazing thing to me is the number of, I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people will believe a lie like that. And so that's why I brought up John chapter 21. But anyway, it's the same, same lie, different teller. John 13 verse 1, now before uh, the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Verse 2 is what I have up on the screen, and we're going to deal with this tonight. And I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to think about it tonight. Have you ever been betrayed? And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Being betrayed by family members. I have spoken to parents who have been betrayed by their own children. I have spoken to children who have been betrayed by their own parents. Uh, I have spoken to people who have told them by family members that listening to me was just another Jim Jones type cult and they fully expect to us for us to be on the news one day with the cameras on and everybody laying on the ground with a glass in their hand having drunk the poison Kool-Aid uh, but they're being betrayed by the hundreds of thousands if not millions Betrayed by family members, being betrayed by close friends, being betrayed by church members, being betrayed by pastors, pastors being betrayed by church members. When I was about 12 or 13 years old, there was some people in the church, and I loved every pastor that God sent into this place. I loved them. I adored them I wanted to be like them there was one in particular as I was making the change over from childhood uh, into my teenage years and uh, wonderful man of God I think he's now gone on to be with the Lord but there was a group of people here at that church if I remember right there was a church split back in the 60s and I think some of those same people who were part of the church split back in the 60s were some of the same people that led the church split back in the 70s when this pastor was here. But this pastor uh, was encouraged to go to the National Association of Free Will Baptist Convention. So him and his family packed up their suitcases and drove out. I can't remember where it was that year. And while that pastor was gone, the board of trustees, which at that time consisted of both men and women, met without telling him behind his back and all called for a vote of confidence on this pastor the day that he came back from his trip to the National Association. That's just downright dirty. 
But th this ain't the only church that's done it that way. I've heard from other pastors who said that's what they did. They went on some vacation. Their church, so, somebody in the church uh, paid for their vacation. Boy, they thought, man, that's, that's really great. They come back from vacation, find out that a vote's been held and they no longer have a job. And they've got two weeks to, to pack their stuff up and get out. Well, that's what happened back in 19, I think it was 1978, 1979, something like that. And uh, one of the ugliest business meetings I have ever seen in my life. Things were said that should have never been said in the house of God. One lady, a deacon's wife, didn't like a deacon who I felt was one of the most godliest men I've ever known in my life. He supported the pastor. He said something. She got up and slapped him across the face in a business meeting. While her husband's just sitting there. Like that. Didn't take you long to figure out who's in charge of that family. And pretty much the whole thing was organized by that woman. But betrayal. Betrayal is one of the hardest things to endure. It's one of the hardest things to live through. You have friends. You have people who say they love you. You have Facebook friends. And what will happen is you will start confiding in some of these people that you find on Facebook, you think they're, they're your friends. And then all of a sudden, boom, you find out that everything you've told them, they start spreading around to everybody else on the Internet. Those are not real friends. And yet Jesus himself picked Judas Iscariot. And the question is, did Jesus pick Judas knowing that he would do what he was doing right here in John 13, 2. Did Jesus know that? Yes, he did. He knew it from before the foundation of the world. It's just like the creation of Lucifer. And I'm going to get in trouble here in a second, so some of you just get ready to write this down that I said this. God created evil. Look it up. It's in Isaiah. I make good and I create evil, God said. Well, how does he create evil? He made Lucifer. Well, Lucifer was good at the time. Yet, yeah, but did not God know that Lucifer would fall because of his pride, because of his beauty? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? If the word of God is everlasting, then the word of God was written by God before there ever was a heaven and an earth and time. Meaning that God knew exactly what was going to take place when he created Lucifer. He knew exactly what he was doing. Did God know that in making a tree called the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that Eve and then Adam would eventually eat from it. Did he know that? Yes. But you see, that's the only thing that gives man a real choice. If you tell man not to eat of a tree that doesn't exist, then he doesn't really have a choice, does he? Or if you tell man not to eat of a tree and he's hidden it on the planet Jupiter. Well, then it's not really much of a choice then, is, is it either? But you plant it right next to the tree of life in the midst. Both of them are described as being in the midst of the garden. And then to further it, you bring in a tempter. Someone who is going to draw Eve's attention to that tree. Not make her do it because the Bible plainly tells us that man sins when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. His own lust. And so Eve just made a choice based upon what was already in her. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Jesus 
picked Judas, and I've mentioned this before, every time you find a list of the 12 disciples, you're always going to find Peter's name first. And it's always going to be jumbled up who's in the middle. And you're always going to find Judas' name last. Every time, just like in the wilderness tabernacle, Judah always led off the traveling in the wilderness, and Dan always was at the very end of the line, always. It was Judah at front, Dan at the tail. Now, turn to Second Timothy. We can expect more, not less, of this thing called betrayal. As we get closer and closer and closer to the very last of the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. Know this also that in the last days perilous. Perilous means dangerous. Perilous times shall come. For men. Here's what I think is the basis of being a traitor. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Did Judas just hand over Jesus for free? No. I want 30 pieces of silver out of it. I want some cash. That in the last days, perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. Boasters. Proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, young people, remember that. Disobedient to parents is put in the same list as covetousness, boasters, the proud, and those who blaspheme God. I've heard people curse God by using, in my opinion, one of the dirtiest words that you could use in the English language to say that to God. A lot of times when these women gather for either for their abortion rights or whatever, and they want to inflame the pro-life people on the other side of the street, they will wear Uh, T-shirts to inflame them like Satan loves you. Things like that. They will do that just to blaspheme our God and make us angry. And let me say this about our God. I, I I am zealous for our Lord. I'm zealous for his house. I'm zealous for his word. But God doesn't need me to defend him. God writes everything down in everybody's name along with it, does he not? God will get them. You don't have to worry about it. God will get them. But anyway, they are blasphemers and diso... See, that's, that's what leads to that kind of blasphemy is that these same people are disobedient to their parents. They are unthankful. They are unholy people. They're without natural affection. When a woman conceives a child and carries that child in her womb, natural affection says, this is my child and I'm going to protect it at all costs. I'm going to protect it even at the expense of my own life. I will protect this baby. That's natural affection. It is unnatural to go to a abortion mills office and say to that doctor, I want you to tear this child apart so that it no longer lives inside of me and I will not have to deal with this thing that is in me. That is without natural affection. Truce breakers. That means people who do not keep promises. False accusers, incontinent. What does that word mean? Do what? No self-control. In 
the medical field, it means they can't hold their stuff in. In real life, it's the same, only it deals with the mouth. They can't hold their stuff in. They're incontinent. They are fierce. Despisers of those that are good. And then they are, here it is in verse 4, traitors. They will betray country for their own gain. They will betray Americans for their own gain. Politicians will betray the very people that voted them in office for their own personal and political and financial gain. They'll do that. Heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, Hunter Biden, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. He didn't say, for such, vote for them. He said, from such, turn away from them. But he mentioned traitors in here. That is a sign of the last days that are coming upon us. And we're going to see more in the way of betrayal and not less. It will get down to, we will only be able to trust God's word, God's spirit, God himself, Jesus Christ, we will only be able to trust the word of God. That's how bad it's going to get. And I, I've been in this church for years. I've been betrayed many times. I will be betrayed again. There's no doubt about it. Uh, when I go through it, people in my family know, people in this church know, I don't deal with it well. I crawl in a hole and suck my thumb and get up in a fetal position and cry for about three or four days. I don't like it, but it happens. It happened recently, it'll happen again. Now, I want to look at this. That's, John said that Satan or the devil put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. Let's look at what Luke said about it. In Luke 22, 1, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, and they feared the people. Verse 3, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot. Which means, this, this is the record that we have of the Bible. Of, in, my, in my mind, the only person that Satan himself ever inhabited in the Bible. Now, you had people who were possessed of devils, which were probably lesser spirits. But we've got a job here that cannot be fouled up. It cannot be messed up. We have to have Jesus Christ killed. You don't leave that job to devils who can't even tie their own shoes. You've got to go into Judas Iscariot yourself if you're the devil. If you're Satan, you've got to enter into Judas yourself to make sure this gets done correctly so that Jesus is killed. And once he's killed, you now have access to the throne. I mean, we're seeing the... the line of succession take place in England. The rightful heir to the throne was Prince Charles, who is now King Charles. He went, um, what do they call it? The, the heir something to the heir apparent. He's been, it's been known since he was a child that he was going to be the successor to Queen Elizabeth II. He now has 
uh, taken the throne. He is King Charles III. And so now William is the new heir apparent to the throne. So when Charles dies, Prince William will become King William, the whatever number he is. Okay? Um, and so we have a line to the throne going on here. But there has been times in British history where somebody's been killed and gotten out of the way so somebody could advance up the line and be the next person on the throne. That was in the days when kings had absolute rule over the people. So anyway... Verse 3, then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. He's entering into him personally. Because the chief priests and scribes, in verse 2, sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Verse 4, he went on his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him into them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him into them uh, unto them in the absence of the multitude. In other words, we can't let everybody see this. This has to be a big secret. Uh, we're going to do this in a cryptic fashion. Nobody's going to know. We don't know who poisoned Michael. But it could have been somebody that he trusted. Could have been. And then back in John chapter 13 and verse, let me skip down to verse 27. Satan has put it into the mind. This is John again. Satan has put it into the mind of Judas. Now, Jesus says um, in verse 25, he then lying on Jesus' breast said to him, Lord, who is it? Who's going to betray you? Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give sop. Give a, that's where we get the word supper from. Because you take your biscuit and dip it in the gravy. The sop. You sop that biscuit. Okay? Um, it is, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Jesus knew. He knew all along. He didn't go, Judas? By the way, Jesus knew Judas was a thief too. He held the bag. Who else could have rights to steal all the money? That was Judas. Um, then you have people in the Bible that were betrayed. Judges chapter 16, you might want to turn there. When Samson, when went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot, went in unto her, and it was told the Gazite, saying, Samson has come thither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight and rose at midnight took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Samson, one weakness, and it was good-looking women, and the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee, every one of us, eleven hundred pieces of silver. Now there's five hundred lords of the Phil or five lords of the Philistines. So five times eleven hundred is how much? It's fifty five hundred pieces of silver. That's a pretty good chunk of cash that she's going to get. But see, this, all of this is a foreshadowing of Christ. They want to know how they can kill the strongest man in the world that nobody else can kill. There has to be a source of his strength. Where is it? 
It's in the seven locks of his hair, that, which are the seven spirits of God. And they paid her a huge sum of money. Now think about it. Back earlier in this passage, Samson is in this city, but he's there with a harlot. What's the one thing harlots love more than being with a man? Taking their money. And Delilah was the same kind of woman. And if there's anything she likes more than being with a big, strong man, it's taking money. And here she's going to get rich by these five lords of the Philistines. 5,500 pieces of silver she's going to get for doing this thing. So in verse 19, she made him sleep upon her knees and she called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. She began to afflict him and his strength went from him. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. He got betrayed by the very woman that he found comfort from. That's who betrayed him. So verse 26, Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth. I love this story. Uh, just before I get into this, how, remember how many devils are kicked out of heaven? A third of them. Okay, so remember this number, three. So, verse 27, Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were upon the roof. The roof is a picture of heaven. 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up, the one on, with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. This is what he's doing right here. I like this. It's my favorite story. And he bowed himself with all his might and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. That means all... 3,000 people that were on the roof of that building, what happened when he took those pillars down? They all fell from heaven, didn't they? Just like one-third of the angels falling down from heaven. That's how Christ is going to destroy them. He's already done it at the cross. It's already done. Those devils that are up there, they're coming down one of these days. Amen? But it was the betrayal that did it. Uh, I, and I like... Now, Daniel... Or excuse me, Ezekiel calls Satan wiser than Daniel. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Satan is cunning... He is intelligent, he's brilliant as a tactician, the beast that he gives his power to, the world says who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him. So understand this, that the devil is an extremely brilliant, intelligent, wise creature but he couldn't see the one most important thing that he needed to see he couldn't see that in killing Christ it had never occurred to him that he would rise back up from the dead never entered his mind Alicia, the day that we were supposed to go to Kenya, remember that? And the airport said, we don't want your nasty kids on the plane with us. 
It wasn't quite like that. So we left and went home. We were driving in Festus. And I did. I hit the steering wheel of the car mad. And your mom said, what? I said, those pastors from Samburu were coming to give me a gift. Had I thought that at the airport, I would have got on the plane. And clearly, and then, then the thought that came to me was, why didn't I think of this at the airport? And it's because I would have gotten on the plane. And it was clear to me by then that God didn't want me over there. That God, for some reason... Wanted Mike Hudson to have my present and not me. But anyway, I'm not angry. So look at this, 1 Corinthians 2. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes. He's talking about the spirits of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none... Of the princes of this world knew. No devil, no matter how smart, no matter how intelligent, no devil figured out what Calvary was supposed to be all about. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would have never, they would have said, We're not killing Jesus. That's going to destroy our kingdom. What, what do you think, we're dumb? He's, I mean, yeah, we were born not last night, but, you know, hey, we're still pretty smart here. But they never, God hid it from them. It's like dogs that can't see certain colors. Deer that can't see orange, Matthew. We can see it a mile away. But deer can't see it. And there are things that God can hide from the animals of this world, the beasts of this. There are things that God can hide from us that we can't see. We can't see five seconds into the future. So that means we have to trust God for everything, including the next five seconds, because we don't know what's going to happen. So anyway, uh, I could keep on reading this, but... He spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly on the cross, triumphing over them in it. Had they known that, they would have never crucified him the way they did. They would have never put that crown of thorns on his head. They would have never put that purple robe on him. They would have never written, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. They would have never taken his robe off. They would never parted his garments and cast lots for his vesture. All they have to do is make the prophecies of the Bible wrong one time. And then nobody has to believe the Bible anymore. But have they ever succeeded? No, and they never will. Amen.